The famine worsens, and Simeon is still imprisoned in Egypt. Will Jacob let Benjamin go? Will Joseph keep his word? And will Judah prove his worth? All this and more as we continue the epic tale of the family of Jacob. It's a mess. <laughs> it sure is. Greetings and welcome to the Bible Paladin, where we will answer these questions and see how they might inspire us today. I won't go into too much background because the text that we will read today should bring us up to speed. But if you want to learn more, you can check out this previous video. And so let's jump right into chapter 43 and see how this conversation between Jacob and his sons goes. And so let us begin by asking the Lord to bless our reading of the sacred word. Now the famine in the land grew more severe. So when they had used up all the rations they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, Go back and procure us a little more food. But Judah replied, The man strictly warned us, You shall not appear in my presence unless your brother is with you. If you are willing to let our brother go with us, we will go down to procure food for you. But if you are not willing, we will not go down, because the man told us, You shall not appear in my presence unless your brother is with you. Israel demanded, Why did you bring this trouble on me by telling the man that you had another brother? They answered, The man kept asking about ourselves and our family. Is your father still living? Do you have another brother? We had to answer his questions. How could we know that he would say, Bring your brother down here? Then Judah urged his father Israel, Let the boy go with me, that we may be off and on our way, if you and we and our children are to keep from starving to death. I myself will stand surety for him. You can hold me responsible for him. If I fail to bring him back, to set him in your presence, you can hold it against me forever. Had we not dilly-dallied, we could have been there and back twice by now. I love the way this begins because the conversation between Israel and his sons seems to come across so naturally. Here he is rehashing all the events that had happened last time and how they screwed everything up last time they went to Egypt. And yet this time, Judah steps forward, really taking the role as the oldest, even though his older brothers, Reuben and Levi, would have been present. While in the last chapter, all the brothers acted as a whole, we will begin to see more of Judah's leadership here. He presents a good argument to his father, and like Reuben tried to last time and was basically ignored, Judah pledges that he will make sure that nothing happens to Benjamin, and he kind of rebukes his father. However, this is not to be condemned as disrespect, because he does have good reason for what he says. Jacob, or Israel, should be concerned about his entire family, not just the sons of Rachel. In fact, his family would have extended beyond all of his children to include their wives and children, their servants and their families. But as we have been told earlier, he refuses to be consoled about the alleged death of his son Joseph, and he's basically given up. But Judah is not going to stand around silently anymore. This time, he's going to finish what he started. And so, how does Israel respond? Their father Israel then told them, If it must be so, then do this. Put some of the land's best products in your baggage and take them down to the man as gifts, some balm and honey, gum and resin, and pistachios and almonds. Also take extra money along, for you must return the amount that was put back in the mouths of your bags. It may have been a mistake. Take your brother too and be off on your way back to the man. May God Almighty dispose the man to be merciful towards you so that he may let your other brother go, as well as Benjamin. As for me, if I am to suffer bereavement, I shall suffer it. It seems that Judah's retort woke Israel up a bit, and he concedes that they do need to go down to Egypt. And going back to his roots of hospitality, he prepares them and makes sure that they have all sorts of gifts to bring to the Egyptians. Also, as a man of integrity, he makes sure that they have double the money to pay for the grain as well as to pay back for the grain that they had gotten last time. He also allows Benjamin to go with them. And this time, he sends them off with a blessing, showing that perhaps this journey may go better than the last one. So the men got the gifts, took double the amount of money with them, and, accompanied by Benjamin, were off on their way down to Egypt to present themselves to Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he told his head steward, Take these men into the house and have an animal slaughtered and prepared, for they are to dine with me at noon. Doing as Joseph had ordered, the steward conducted the men to Joseph's house, but on being led to his house, they became apprehensive. It must be, they thought, on account of the money put back in our bags the first time, that we are taken inside. 
They want to use it as a pretext to attack us and take our donkeys and seize us as slaves. So they went up to Joseph's head steward and talked to him at the entrance of the house. If you please, sir, they said, we came down here once before to procure food. But when we arrived at a night's encampment and opened our bags, there was each man's money in the mouth of his bag, our money in the full amount. We have now brought it back. We have brought other money to procure food with. We do not know who put the first money in our bags. Be at ease, he replied. You have no need to fear. Your God and the God of your father must have put treasures in your bags for you. As for your money, I received it. With that, he led Simeon out to them. The steward then brought the men inside Joseph's house. He gave them water to bathe their feet and got fodder for their donkeys. Then they set out their gifts to await Joseph's arrival at noon, for they had heard that they were to dine there. In the scene that plays out, Joseph acts much more within his role as a Egyptian governor, as he has a steward handle everything before he even interacts with his brothers. And what he'd asked him to do actually reveals a bit of Joseph's intention, as he has him prepare a meal for his brothers. He has not forgotten the value of hospitality. His brothers, on the other hand, suspect the worst, for they have no idea why they've been singled out to go to the royal house. And because of this apprehension, they plead their case to the steward. They are completely honest with him and let him know that they are prepared to pay what they owe. Now the steward is in on this whole charade because he was probably the same one that put the money back in their bags in the first place. And if not, Joseph surely let him know what was going on because he informed them that they do not owe him anything. Not only that, but he speaks like an ambassador for Joseph, which he is, but in a similar way that a prophet would speak on the behalf of God. He tells them, fear not, and then suggests that perhaps it was their God that put treasure in their bags. It would be odd for an Egyptian to speak about the God of their fathers. So either Joseph had told him exactly what to say, or he picked up on the faith of the Hebrews from the time he spent with him. And then Simeon is led out to them, finally freed from his captivity. But it gets better. Water is provided for them to wash their feet, and their animals are fed. This detail is one that is shared in many of the stories of the ancestors, mostly in anticipation of a positive meeting or announcement. Now with clean feet, they enter into the house, most likely a palatial estate with complete bewilderment. They don't know of Egyptian customs, but certainly they weren't expecting this kind of treatment. So let's see how their supper goes. When Joseph came home, they presented him with the gifts they had brought inside, while they bowed down before him to the ground. After inquiring how they were, he asked them, and how is your aged father of whom you spoke? Is he still in good health? Your servant, our father, is thriving and still in good health, they said, as they bowed respectfully. When Joseph's eye fell on his full brother Benjamin, he asked, Is this your youngest brother of whom you told me? Then he said to him, May God be gracious to you, my boy. With that, Joseph had to hurry out, for he was so overcome with affection for his brother that he was on the verge of tears. He went into a private room and wept there. After washing his face, he reappeared and now in control of himself gave the order, serve the meal. It was served separately to him, to the brothers, and to the Egyptians who partook of his board. Egyptians may not eat with Hebrews, that is abhorrent to them. When they were seated by his directions according to their age, from the oldest to the youngest, they looked at one another in amazement. And as portions were brought to them from Joseph's table, Benjamin's portion was five times as large as anyone else's. So they drank freely and made merry with him. His brothers begin by presenting him with gifts, still expecting the worst, a bit reminiscent of how Jacob presented Esau with gifts before their reunion. And like Esau, Joseph shows that he has no ill will towards them and asks about their family, beginning with their dad. And while they're talking about him, it seems that Joseph finally sees Benjamin and immediately asks about him. And at this point, he is overcome with emotion gives him a blessing, and refers to him as my boy or my son, which is a term of affection. And of course, this Joseph realizes he may be giving himself away, and so he runs into the back room and weeps. I think this scene is one of the reasons why I love this story so much. The way that Joseph's love for his brothers and his emotions are so beautifully described. Also, it is interesting that he goes through great lengths to keep up with charade, like a true son of Jacob. But it is not just to fool his brothers because it is part of God's plan that will be revealed in time. The dining arrangements follow what would be customary based on everyone's station and ethnicity. 
Joseph would sit apart because of his status as being second only to Pharaoh. His men would then be served separately. And finally, the Hebrews would be separated and served last. Still, this was quite a treat for them to be served in the same hall at all, which showed in their amazement. And Benjamin was obviously given special treatment with a portion larger than anyone's. The last line shows that finally, the brothers are able to relax and enjoy this banquet, realizing that they were not summoned for some kind of punishment, and that this mysterious Egyptian man had no ill will towards them. And this is really the first time that we are shown all 12 brothers together and sharing a meal. Now, the significance of meal, we will discuss a little bit later. But first, let's see what Joseph has planned next. Then Joseph gave his head steward these instructions. Fill the men's bags with as much food as they can carry, and put each man's money in the mouth of his bag. In the mouth of the youngest one's bag, put also my silver goblet, together with the money for his rations. The steward carried out Joseph's instructions. At daybreak, the men and their donkeys were sent off. They had not gone far out of the city when Joseph said to his head steward, Go at once after the men. When you overtake them, say to them, Why did you repay good with evil? Why did you steal the silver goblet from me? It is the very one from which my master drinks and which he uses for divination. What you have done is wrong. When the steward overtook them and repeated these words to them, they remonstrated with him. How can my Lord say such things? Far be it from your servants to do such a thing. We even brought back to you from the land of Canaan the money that we found in the mouths of our bags. Why then would we steal silver or gold from your master's house? If any of your servants is found to have the goblet, he shall die. And as for the rest of us, we shall become my Lord's slaves. But he replied, Even though it ought to be as you propose, only the one who is found to have it shall become my slave, and the rest of you shall be exonerated. Then each of them eagerly lowered his bag to the ground and opened it. And when a search was made, starting with the oldest and ending with the youngest, the goblet turned up in Benjamin's bag. When reading the story for the first time, I always thought it was unusual that Joseph would want to test them again, and it seems like a pretty cruel way of doing that. I mean, he had just had this great meal with them. He found out what he needed to about his father, and he is able to see his full brother. And yet, he puts his silver goblet in Benjamin's bag. I mean, it's obvious that he doesn't want to hurt his younger brother. So what gives? Although Joseph's brothers did return his promise with their brother, he still wants to make sure that they can be trusted and have really changed from the time of his youth. Given the chance, would they abandon the other son of Rachel to the Egyptians? Or would they act on his behalf? There is certainly a lot of symbolism in this story and calls back to the previous events, but ultimately it serves as a test for the sons of Israel and will allow Judah to take his place as a leader. A silver cup is placed in Benjamin's sack, just as Joseph was sold for silver. When they are accused of theft, they deny it and assert that whoever has it should die. Recall, the same thing happened when Rachel stole from Laban when they had left his household. However, in that case, she actually stole it and was not caught. And yet in this situation, Benjamin and his brothers are innocent, and yet they are found guilty with the object in question. And this is where the test begins. So let's look at a little bit at the significance of the silver goblet. The steward refers to the cup of his master as the one he uses for divination. The Egyptians did practice divination by looking at the swirling liquids and saw them as a message or predictions from the gods. Of course, the Israelites did not practice such a thing, and this would become to be forbidden in their laws. Joseph himself would not have practiced divination, but for many of the Egyptians, they would simply assume that he did. How else would he have been able to interpret dreams and foresee the years of abundance and famine? His brothers, too, may have suspected that he had powers of prophecy in order to know the things that he did. Either way, to steal the cup would be seen as a great offense, especially after the hospitality that they were offered. And so, now that Benjamin is accused, how do his brothers react? At this, they tore their clothes. Then when each man had reloaded his donkey, they returned to the city. As Judah and his brothers re-entered Joseph's house, he was still there. So they flung themselves on the ground before him. How could you do such a thing? Joseph asked them. You should have known that such a man as I could discover by divination what happened. Judah replied, What can we say to my Lord? How can we plead or how to try to prove our innocence? God has uncovered your servant's guilt. Here we are then, the slaves of my Lord, 
the rest of us no less than the one in whose possession the goblet was found. Far be it from me to act thus, said Joseph. Only the one in whose possession the goblet was found shall become my slave. The rest of you may go back safe and sound to your father. All of the brothers go back to the house of Joseph to plead on behalf of their brother Benjamin. And Joseph doubles down on this belief that he knows things through divination. And then the brothers admit their guilt. In fact, they say that God has uncovered their guilt. And there's really a double meaning for this because they were not guilty in stealing the goblet, but they were guilty for what they did to Joseph so many years ago. And so that's really the guilt that they're finally admitting to. But then comes the final test. Will they stick up for Benjamin or will they leave him? Judah then stepped up to him and said, I beg you, my Lord, let your servant speak earnestly to my Lord and do not become angry with your servant for you are the equal of Pharaoh. My Lord asks your servants, have you a father or another brother? So he said to my Lord, we have an aged father and a young brother, the child of his old age. This one's full brother is dead. And since he is the only one by that mother who is left, his father dotes on him. Then you told your servants, bring him down to me that my eyes may look on him. We replied to my Lord, the boy cannot leave his father. His father would die if he were to leave him. But you told your servants, unless your youngest brother comes back with you, you shall not come into my presence again. When we returned to your servant, our father, we reported to him the words of my Lord. Later, our father told us to come back and buy some food for the family. So we reminded him, we cannot go down there. Only if our youngest brother is with us can we go. For we may not see the man if our youngest brother is not with us. Then your servant, our father, said to us, as you know, my wife bore me two sons. One of them, however, disappeared, and I had to conclude that he must have been torn to pieces by wild beasts. I have not seen him since. If you now take this one away from me too, and some disaster befalls him, you will send my white head down to the netherworld in grief. If then the boy is not with us, when I go back to your servant, my father, whose very life is bound up with his, he will die as soon as he sees that the boy is missing. And your servants will thus send the white head of our father down to the netherworld in grief. Besides, I, your servant, got the boy from his father by going surety for him, saying, If I fail to bring him back to you, father, you can hold it against me forever. Let me, your servant, therefore, remain in place of the boy as the slave of my Lord, and let the boy go back with his brothers. How could I go back to my father if the boy were not with me? I could not bear to see the anguish that would overcome my father. Wow, reading that got me a little bit emotional. The speech of Judah really sums up the last few chapters of Genesis from his perspective. And it's the longest continuous speech of any one person in Genesis. And it does a few things. It brings Judah's story to full circle from the time that he went down from his brothers and made choices that contrast those of Joseph. He also shares the anguish that their father has been going through ever since Joseph's alleged death. His speech also acts as a means to be reconciled to both his family and to God. He takes the place as leader of this tribe and even proposes to stay behind in place of Benjamin. Taking the story as a whole up until this point, what could we learn about God's interaction with his people? Throughout the narrative, Joseph has really been acting as a prophet for God, or as an ambassador, as he shows that what he's doing is actually the will of God. And we also see that the Lord is shown to be a God of mercy, but also that of justice. The brothers of Joseph were indeed guilty in their plot to kill him. The anguish that they went through between their two trips to Egypt can be seen as just punishment for their crime. Their father Jacob, too, was not innocent throughout his life and made choices in order to deceive others on multiple occasions. And he too suffered throughout this story. But this tale is also sprinkled with mercy. Joseph shows mercy when he gives them grain for free. He only retains one brother while allowing the others to return on their first trip. He welcomes them on their second trip and shows hospitality. He provides them a feast in his royal home. And finally, he allows Judah to speak on behalf of his family and plead his case. But before returning to Judah's speech, let's take a look at the banquet for a moment. Meals throughout Genesis have almost exclusively been associated with covenants. These promises are seen either between God and his people or between two parties with God as their witness. The meal in this story is described in detail, but no covenant is mentioned, at least not explicitly. 
but perhaps we can see this as evidence or even foreshadowing of a covenant. Joseph was wrought with emotion right before the meal. And then we see all 12 brothers eating together in a foreign land. And they represent the 12 tribes of Israel. Perhaps this can be seen as a fulfillment of part of the covenant that was made with Abraham a few generations ago. How else might you see this as a fulfillment or as a covenant meal? Returning to Judah's speech, I think this can be seen not only as a plea to Joseph, but also a prayer to God. He begins by pleading for mercy. He looks back on the past few years of his life and is able to see the effect his actions have had on his family. He acknowledges his own part in them and also calls his brothers to repent. Finally, he offers himself in place of his younger brother, willing to take the blame and punishment. As a model for prayer, it reminds me of the examen, which was developed or at least popularized by St. Ignatius of Loyola in his spiritual exercises. While the examen does differ a bit from Judah's speech, it does give us an opportunity to bring our day or week before God as we enter into prayer. The prayer begins with an act of thanksgiving, acknowledging all that one is grateful for. The next step is to ask the Spirit for guidance as one searches through the activities of the day and recognizes the presence of God. Then one takes the time to recognize and review the good things as well as failures throughout the day. The next step is to ask for forgiveness and healing, but not to end there. In realizing such sins, one must pray for the strength to move forward and to discern how to avoid such failures in the future. Finally, the last step is to look forward to the next day and ask for guidance in moving forward, to resolve to do better. Then, like Judah, we too can open ourselves up to transformation and a closer relationship with the Lord. And so, does the speech of Judah convince Joseph? Well, you have to wait to the next episode to find out. Until then, keep reflecting and do good.